Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today with one of our favorite guests, Mr. Nick Thomas of Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Nick, great to see you. Good to be back. We're talking to you uh, the week after Thanksgiving, so I hope you had a great mm -hmm. time to sit back with family and recharge a little bit. Mm, great time. Very good time. Thank you. I know I did, and Nick, of course, is what we call him the astronaut wrangler out of Kennedy Space Center over 35 years of being the one of the lead communicators out there. Just now starting my 38th year. 38 years. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I'm sure you're going to retire someday, but like you said, you don't feel like you've worked a day in your life. <laughs> as, long as, I'm, as long as my health is good and I'm enjoying myself, I'm there. Good. Good, but we're glad to have you out there. He introduces the astronauts that are at the Astronaut Encounter, one of Delaware North's wonderful things they do at the Kennedy Visitors Complex. We enjoy our astronauts, get autographs for them uh, twice a day. Uh, they present themselves, tell their stories, and uh, and we've gotten familiar with a few of them like you have over time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Nick, today is going to talk about something as a baby boomer that he and I are very familiar with and passionate about, and that is the Apollo 12 moon landing in November 1969, November 19th, in fact, we doubled down on the pledge by the great President Kennedy to land on the moon before the end of the decade and return a man safely. Uh, it's just thrilling to to think about this mission for me, Nick, because mm -hmm. the guys were great. It was a, a time of, uh, uh, you know, when America was coming out of a tailspin with, well, still in a tailspin with Vietnam War and, yeah. and civil rights, but, uh, uh, and quite a crew. Yeah, and it was really the uh, penultimate mission as far as the ability to prove uh, what we were going to do. And I'll talk about that a little later on when Pete Conrad saw the surveyor crater right in the center of his landing designator pointer. He, he just summed it up very nicely, and we'll go over that a little later on in the presentation. And if you want to watch one of the, the most exciting landings and hear Al Bean and Pete Conrad talking to each other on the last seven minutes going down to the moon, that YouTube video is priceless. I'll bet I've watched it a hundred times, I, Nick. I can remember at the time, my mother was not at all into the space program. She didn't get it by her own admission. But when she heard Pete and Al descending and heard them whooping it up on their way down to the moon, she told me, she says, I like these guys. They're not like those last guys who are just stuffed shirts. These guys are having fun. So they, if they could capture my mother's imagination, they, uh, they cut a good trail there. Well, Nick's going to entertain your imagination with some personal tales of this one-of-a-kind crew of Pete Conrad, Al Bean, and Dick Gordon, who were, were friends for life, mm -hmm. Navy buddies. Yeah. Uh, just, just a great story. Besties, and, I think the young people say now. Besties, yeah, they were besties, is, is right. <laughs> they were du double besties. And uh, look at this picture that Nick uh, shared with us that Marty chose as a green screen. Marty Winkle, my co-producer, climbed up this scaffold. Well, he didn't climb it. He was on an elevator and got in the slaw that's just above mm -hmm. the picture there where his lunar module that he was working on was. But what unusual perspective. I believe it's coming out of the VAB, correct? Well, it's a glorious perspective, and the first time this shot had ever been taken. I think they did it again on Apollo 14. But this was the first time they thought of mounting the camera up on the roof of the vehicle assembly building and getting that remarkable perspective of how imposing and, yes, how majestic this vehicle was. I mean, it, I can I can look at it any number of times, but it still catches my heart just right. Oh, I hear you. And uh, growing up in Daytona Beach area, yeah. you came to rock the, some of the launches, correct? Came to all the Apollo launches. Uh, how close Dad, could you get as a, I mean, we were when, they, when they weren't, was it wasn't launch day? Was there a few places you could drive over at the... Uh, over at the beach? Well, uh, the uh, visitor's complex, when they took their bus tours out, when the vehicle was out on the pad, they would take their buses right by the launch pads. And you could see the Saturn V standing out there on the pad. Uh, I think they continued those until the time that they would roll the mobile service structure away. Mm -hmm. And then those tours were good for two more days, I think. And then after that, the route mm -hmm. was shut down. Um, as for viewing the launch, uh, we were in, Dad and I were in Titusville across the river where um, J.C. Penney's was, where Titus Landing now is. And uh, we were there on the edge of the river where that uh, condominium is, a big gray oh. condominium. And that's where we were for all the launches, starting with uh, 
Apollo 9, I think it was. I've seen pictures of that, Nick, and it's also I'm probably in there. Uh, so yeah, I'm... and there's also <laughs> one of the great Apollo, you know, 50th anniversary movies uh, mm -hmm. had a helicopter pan right, across. Right. Mm -hmm. Every, I mean, that's kind of a high wall, and people got their legs dangling off yeah, of right. it and yep. all that. Yeah, yep, I remember. You were in that area. Huh? Right in there, yeah. That's cool. Well, we're going to enjoy some tales with that. We first want to let you know that we're going to enjoy a great weekend of guests on Stay Curious with Nick today. Of course, tell your friends. You can always watch it on YouTube at any time. Mikey Haddad is going to be with us Wednesday, as he is once a month, talking about the drama of STS-51A, the deployment of a, of a satellite. This was the 1985 mission uh, when uh, the, the space truck was doing what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And, uh, of course, Mikey is a Level 4 technician, a NASA engineer, uh, not technician. And he'll have a couple of guests on to talk about that. And then uh, Chris Stott is going to be on Friday, a recorded program. He is the CEO of Lone Star, a company, Nick, that wants to put your uh, data on the moon in case there's catastrophe here on Earth. Uh, he's got clients to do this. It's quite an in innovative idea. Uh, they're going to launch their hard drive, so to speak, uh, on a, a SpaceX rocket here mm -hmm. coming up. And I think in July they're going to transmit the, uh, uh, the, the uh, U.S. Uh, Constitution uh, to the moon and have the Bill of Rights sent back to it. Cool. Now, refresh my memory. Was Chris with us at the uh, Shuttle Fest some time ago? Uh, yes, he was. Oh, okay. uh, Chris right. is yeah, the uh, husband of uh, Nicole, Stott. Nicole Stott. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yep, yep, he was. You, if, if you met him there, well, let's go back here. If you met him then, uh, oh, big, yeah, uh, getting in the groove here, Marty. Yes, Chris is the husband of Nicole Stott. They've been married for mm -hmm. quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was there. And uh, we might get him, you know, it's a fascinating story about uh, why we need this and people involved in it. So that's Friday. Mm -hmm. Three great interviews this week. And uh, then we'll do the regular programming of the shuttles of November. We'll wrap up. And maybe a little stargazing on Thursday. We'll see how things go. But uh, here's a guy that wanted to have the right stuff. And look at this guy, Marty. That is the, the gantry from Apollo that I remember walking across when it was in the rocket, rocket garden. garden. Right. All right. Who is this guy? A handsome looking guy there. Well, trying out for yours truly. Yours truly. The there you are, buddy. All uh, right. I figured that one way to distinguish myself against all the others who were looking for rolls and right stuff would be to get these pictures taken. I'd found that pressure suit in Times Square at an Army Navy store in Times Square and immediately purchased purchased it and called my photographer in Daytona and said, meet me at the visitor's complex in a week. We're going to take some pictures. So I got there and talked to George McGuire, who was marketing director, and got his permission to take these pictures. And I simply took a group of pictures that uh, generic sort of uh, astronaut on the way to the uh, pad uh, pictures. And uh, Joni, who was my photographer, uh, positioned that shot so well to have the Gemini oh, Titan yeah. in the background, That's... and uh, it was a fun day. It was a good shoot, and it was productive because it did get me the screen test with Lynn Stallmaster, which, of course, I uh, I got but didn't get the part, but it was a pretty adventurous time in my life. You said you were close to getting that part of which astronaut in the right stuff? I did the uh, screen test. I did the line for Gordon Cooper, and uh, several months later, when I called Lynn's office in Los Angeles, and asked him if I got the role. He said, no. He says, it's already been cast. I said, who got it? He says, I can't tell you until the press release. So uh, in the conversation, he said, I don't know if I should tell you this because I don't know how you're going to take it. I said, well, tell me. Everything helps. He said, you're among the last five people to be disqualified. Hmm. Now, he might have just been saying that to make me feel good. I don't know. But nevertheless, uh, I did, up, did get up to the degree of getting a, a screen test with him, talking to the producer and so forth. So... It was a major milestone. It wasn't successful, but it was certainly a great adventure in my life. And you were, had aspirations of being an actor, which uh, yeah. I find very admirable. And, and obviously, you know, set the stage, to use a pun, mm -hmm. for what you're doing today. Yeah, a lot, of what, talking I, with people a lot and, of what I experienced in New York helped prepare me for what I'm doing right now. So yeah. everything leads to something. 
It does. It yeah. doesn't. And and Nick is very uh, you're sought after to MC events. You've MC'd a couple events for we MC'd Marty's event for the Grummies, the Grummies. and Master Ceremonies for our Shuttle Fest coming up. And uh, yep, I think I'd I'd love that about Nick. Uh, we all have different backgrounds, and uh, but you're always a space lover in the background. Yeah, uh, I've got. I think I've got a lot of interest, uh, but probably uh, space flight history and space flight technology and the upcoming programs are probably the the, the most important uh, in in my life because mm -hmm. it's just fun to watch and it's fun to see history not only develop but also watch history come around and repeat itself because right now uh, with the Artemis program we're about where we were back in 1966 67 getting ready for the Apollo program so it all comes full circle we're having the thrill of watching the hardware develop uh, have the hardware come together our first test flight of the big rocket last uh, uh, November and uh, just seeing all the steps along the way, just as we saw them take place during the Apollo program. Um, talking to one of the workers in the uh, operations and checkout building, all of 23 years old. <laughs> and uh, I talked to him and I said, how's it coming? He says, well, he says, we got a number of problems that we're working on. I said, well, is your management listening to you? He said, yeah, they're, they're listening. I said, that's the important thing. I said, every new vehicle is going to have its share, uh, its share of problems. Don't sweat it. You know, you'll work through them. So long as your management is listening to you, then you're going to be okay. Because along with the positive uh, memories of the hardware coming together and new hardware taking shape and so forth, the, the, the less pleasant memories of, say, Apollo 1 also come to mind. And you just want people to be focused properly, uh, devoting their energies in the right way, uh, not getting too far over their skis, shall we say, and simply exercising that good judgment that's going to be required for any developmental flight test program. So it's very exciting to see this come around again. It basically puts me back to where I was back in huh. 67 and 68. So it, in a way, it's reliving some of the adventure of my youth and that's uh, <clears throat> not everybody gets to do that no they don't the coast is on fire with artemis yeah, yeah. and the young people uh involved with it uh and uh sander 35 years old and the great jobs that they're doing uh and we'll talk about that later we could just get too diverse here because when that Blue Origin New Glenn rocket starts taking off, Nick, I think people are going to be shocked mm -hmm. how big it is and powerful and what its capabilities yeah. are. So uh, anyway, we're going to have a great program here about Apollo 12. Wanted to talk a couple things with Nick about, uh, I think that was cool. And here's a great shot of you in the oh. middle a few years later. You never imagined when you were in this picture, maybe, <laughs> that you would be standing around these guys. No, no, not look at, at all. Our, look at oh, our heroes God. there. Who do you have there from left from to right? From left to right, we got uh, J.R. Riley, space shuttle astronaut. Next to him is Walt Cunningham from Apollo 7. Uh, next to him is Fred Hayes, of course, Apollo 13. And then uh, to the right of me is Al Warden, who is a very, very good friend, a wonderful guy, and uh, a guy I think I, I must think about couple of times every day he was, oh, a, he was a good man yeah. a good friend and he loved what he did over the visitors complex and then after him we got charlie duke from paula 16 and then ed mitchell uh ed and i went back to the time when i was in new york city ed's organization of uh, uh noetic sciences was sponsoring a play on broadway oh really and so having known ed before through dick davis they invited me to the uh preview and we watched the show, and the the show was called uh, Dance a Little Closer. And when it opened on Broadway, it only lasted about a week. And what they called it on the street was Close a Little Faster. But, you know, <laughs> that's, that's Broadway. That's how it goes. But yeah. Ed was a wonderful guy. Ed helped to arrange my gold badge, gold badge tour shortly after Apollo 14. And Stu Russo met my father and Dick and I over at the oh, wow. uh, ONC building. I got time in the... CM and the Lunar Module Simulator, so Ed was a good friend. And then after him, Dick Gordon from Apollo 12. Uh, you know, if you have ever heard any of the stories about the conviviality of the Apollo 12 crew and their sense of humor and all the rest of it, it didn't hold a patch to what you discovered in Dick Gordon. Dick was one of the friendliest, funniest guys around. Um, 
uh, test pilot, of course, uh, from Tuxent River. He was, uh, I believe he was instructed, he and Al Bean were both instructed by Pete Conrad at Pax River. Um, later on, around this uh, stage of his life, uh, he was a widower and uh, was kind of reverting back to what I'll call his uh, his Navy test flight persona <laughs> in that he would, he had a, 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 a fast tie for the ladies. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Dick Gordon we're talking about. Dick was uh, going to do a bus tour with some visitors and there was a communicator assigned to the tour as well, a young lady of my acquaintance, real nice girl. Uh, she had not met Dick, but I just gave her the background, Apollo 12, Gemini 11, and so forth, and decided to let her find out the rest for herself. Oh, okay. So when she came back from the tour. The first thing I asked her, I said, well, have you and Dick, Dick set a wedding date yet? <laughs> but uh, he was just a wonderful guy. High spirits. Um, I mean, if you wanted to experience what it was to be in the Ken of the Apollo 12 crew spent a few minutes with Dick Gordon. You'd understand what that was all about. He was just, you just can't say enough about how friendly and how gracious and how damn funny he was. Well, you're blessed to, to, to be that for sure. I was blessed to just see Uncle Al a couple times yeah. as you introduced him there. And, and uh, he's very involved with our museum. Uh, so, uh, is, uh, I always uh, said Ed that Mitchell, I always said that Al Warden was the Frank Sinatra of the astronauts. He just like Sinatra at halftime during a show would just sit out there on a stool and tell stories. And these yeah. stories would just come rolling out and was just, just the most engaging thing you could ever experience. Yes. So of these guys here, sadly, but but true to humanity and, and, and life expectancy, we just have Fredo. Of course, Ry Riley's uh, okay, with alive with us. Yeah. Uh, Fredo and uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie uh, yeah. Duke there. Uh -huh in there unfortunately mm -hmm. when was that picture made do you remember the year i would have to go back and check the year uh, it's one of many events that we had done at the visitors complex with these uh um, um astronaut round tables with the general public and these were set aside from the aes that we do now the astronaut encounters that we do now in that this would be a single event for a limited number of people and it was a round table we had the astronauts on a panel mm -hmm. and we would start by asking them i would start by asking them each questions and then we'd open up to the questions from the uh, audience and it was a lot of fun because uh, these guys i remember dick gordon in particular being very very good just being able to improvise you know right on the spot and uh, that would be an event to go to yeah wow that would yeah. be uh very interesting and uh, kind of an era when there wasn't so much political correctness. Uh, well, you know, uh, Dick, was... Dick took part in the Apollo 15 reunion with Al Warden and um, Dave Scott since uh, uh, Jim Irwin was no longer with us. And basically, Dick Gordon and Al Warden were the two 12-year-olds in the back seat of the car. <laughs> and Dave Scott was the father saying, don't make me pull this car over. You guys calm down. So it was it was a lot of fun that night. Absolutely. Well, great stories. We we love Nick. Uh, just uh, we've talked several times. Just going to bring him on. Stay curious and talk about current events and stuff, uh, uh, because you have dealt with these legends of Apollo, Mercury, and Gemini all your thirty-five years, thirty-eight years going on strong out there. Wanda, we lost two great astronauts, very influential uh, uh, in our our our, our space programs. Tom Mattingly, there mm -hmm. in the commander's seat. Tell us a little bit about TK. Well, uh, TK was, of course, on the Apollo 16 mission with John Young and Charlie Duke, and then went on to command the, uh, uh, as you see him here, uh, STS-4. Uh, I met TK one time, but it was when I was still in New York. This, this flight took place when I was still in New York. And they were doing a around-the-country tour, and one of the places they came to was... Uh, Macy's department store in New York City for oh, a little really? meet the public kind of thing. So I attended that. And we were all allowed to ask questions. And if you remember, STS-4 was the only shuttle flight to lose their solid rocket boosters. They sank to the bottom of the ocean. <clears throat> so I chanced to ask TK. I said, you know, guys lost your solids. I said, what happened there? And he told me what had happened was the parachutes on the solids opened up, reefed or disreefed in three stages, one, two, three, fully open. And that was done to avoid, you know, shocking those lines and those parachutes with the instant opening with that sudden deceleration. 
So unfortunately, the reefing system failed and it went straight from uh, reef to fully disreefed and it blew out the panels and parachutes and the two uh, SRBs hit the ocean. Uh, they cracked open and sank to the bottom of the sea and that's hmm. where they still are. Hmm. The only ones not recovered, yeah. uh, of course, outside of the 51L. But The other thing about TK, as I've learned from other astronauts, is that TK was a charger. Once he got started on something, he had the blinders on. He was headed toward the, the final goal to the degree that when you were doing a sim or any of uh, the uh, uh, jobs in, at Johnson, if you were working with TK, you know, at some point you'd be looking at your watch. And it was like one thirty, two o'clock. And TK, what about lunch? He said, what about it? <laughs> you know, he didn't he didn't even believe in coffee breaks. Once he started on something, he saw it all the way wow. through to the end. Huh. Yeah, so he was a hard charger. He did something that your friend Al Warden did, was the first person to do. Oh, yeah, deep space, space walk. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I imagine much like Al, that had to be a very stunning sight to be able to turn your head and see the moon on one side and the earth on the other and be able to have that perspective that few, if any, people... Uh, could ever have again changing film that's why i bring this up yeah. the film in the the in the cameras of mm -hmm. the uh science bay uh that looks like this 35 mil roll of film though they're probably 70 millimeter yeah. bigger that's why they had to risk their lives was to get the data uh uh it seems absurd today with yeah the, you didn't have instantaneous the, transmission yeah. then you had to go out there and get the film and unload it from the cassette and just like film, you had to take your chances as far you you could work as diligently as possible on exposure and light settings and so forth. But you know, in the end, uh, you had to be prepared for some unfortunate surprises. Well, good. Uh, he lived a good long life. Yeah. Uh, Tom Mattingly did. He uh, uh, one of the few astronauts to segue from Apollo to uh, shuttle. Uh, the shuttle. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but uh, here's one of our big heroes, and I had this gentleman's picture on my wall oh, yeah. as a kid absolutely uh up there uh, uh my one of my heroes frank borman the picture of frank on the right suiting up for apollo 8 is classic borman uh you can see the determination the professionalism and the no bullshit attitude uh in frank borman in that picture and that's that's the one that i would put in the frame that's a that's a great picture of him mm -hmm. and of course he was so very instrumental in the uh Apollo 1 accident investigation, and then commanding Apollo 8. And of course, he was given his choice about, do you want to fly uh, the LEM tests as we originally had you scheduled for, or do you want to do this idea we have of going around the moon? He said, I'll take the moon. And then after he made that decision, then he went to Lovell and Anders and told them what they were going to do. So there wasn't a lot of voting going on in Frank's spacecraft. But... Uh, uh, he was able to inspire so many people with his own focus and his own uh, laser-like attention to any particular problem. Uh, he was a great morale booster for the people at uh, uh, Downey, California from North American who had just suffered through the loss of Apollo 1. And, of course, that was a terrible time of for the individuals of trying to... Uh, reassert their own self-confidence because everyone was just not knocked flat by that fire. But Frank, being the astronaut uh, on the scene, was able to instill his confidence in these, uh, in these people who are working on the spacecraft. And in so doing, uh, they would inspire their fellow workers and on and on and on. It's the importance of what, what we call morale tours when a flight crew can visit the workers on the line, say at the ONC building or what have you, it it's very important that that rapport of confidence be established. And also a little bit of, uh, hi there, I'm the guy whose life is going to depend on your work. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that too. But Frank, who was the uh, one of the last of the steely-eyed test pilots, I guess, uh, very similar to Wally Schirra, um uh, in uh, tenacity, in stubbornness, in a good way, standing by what he was, what he was, uh, what he what he believed in, and uh, just absolutely determined that uh, everything on his flight, be it Gemini or Apollo, was going to go right by the numbers. And it did, and it's just incredible. The second flight of a spacecraft yeah. uh, designed, it you was designed. flawless for yeah. ten days uh, with a 
Apollo 7. We're just going to take you to the moon with no lunar module. Uh, and uh, boy, were, were my eyes glued to the TV set that whole time, well, there, Christmas Eve, 1968. There was, was a famous story of Frank being in one of these meetings about going to the moon, and there were still some folks in the uh, corporate levels who were a little like, uh, maybe we should do one flight before we try to do this and so forth and so on. And Frank just told them, hey, this whole program is about going to the moon. What the hell do we want to wait for? There you go. And uh, Frank put that, that charge into everybody he worked with. And Frank was also the first to admit, I wasn't in this to get to the moon or uh, gather science. I was in this to beat the Russians, period. And that was his sole reason for doing what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So he, you got also there one of the great cold warriors of our time. And thank God he was. Absolutely, absolutely. 96 years old. Yeah. Uh, his best friend, Jim Lovell, is now the oldest living space flyer mm -hmm. in the history of humanity. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, quite a, uh, quite a career on that. If you don't know much about Frank Borman, look it up. A lot of, he had a, a whole career after NASA uh, in business. Uh, and my cousin, uh, Terry Delapino worked in the Cary, North Carolina, where he had a dealership. Oh, okay. And she got me a picture, yeah. the classic picture of them at the, uh, you know, the, the crew yeah. beside the ladder on there. And I still have that. Well, leading into Frank Borman and, and God bless him and all he did for America, uh, is this question I posed to you 60 years ago. President Kennedy was murdered in, in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, you know, uh, I, I think a lot about it. I, I really do. Uh, being uh, 10 years old when it happened, it was one of the more, one of the first things in my life that I, I remember that I'll never forget. But uh, all that you know about things, uh, Nick, do you think, uh, how did JFK's death affect the moon race? Well, it's an interesting question that we bat around amongst ourselves from time to time. Uh, it is difficult to remember that back in uh, 63, 64, and in, even into 65, the space program was not universally supported by the politicians or the public. But the one thing I think that focused a lot of people on this goal, politically and emotionally, was the fact that we were fulfilling the dream of a martyred president. And that was very important. Uh, and, and that's very important in the American psyche that we pick up the banner and we carry on, much as we did after Apollo 1, after Challenger, and after Columbia. So there is a specific uh, part of the American DNA that sees a tragedy like this as a chance to, to take up the banner and continue with the mission. And I think that was a lot of what got us to the moon and kept that program moving through the halls of Congress and uh, throughout the American uh, uh, um, uh, experience, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it surely rattled our psyche, and and his, uh, I mean, his speech, the moon speech, yeah. will be it'll be talked about a hundred years from now. You're going to hear yeah. that, yeah. and then out there at the Kennedy Visitors Complex, uh, they replaced the fountain of him with uh, uh, a video deal that emphasizes his speech. Mm -hmm. Pops up all over the place mm -hmm. up there. Yeah. So uh, very uh, sixty years later. Uh, we're never going to forget about President Kennedy and wanting to go to the moon. Marty, if you want to entertain any thoughts from a space worker, uh, though they were so busy, they barely knew this happened. I know some of them, but uh, a lot of Apollo workers that are, were in leadership say, yes, this was an underlying thing. The mm -hmm. martyred president, we were sure. going to fulfill his dream. Mm -hmm. And what Nick and I are next going to talk about is double down in November. We did it for the second time with Apollo 12. Marty, did you have any comment about how this, how the workers felt? And if you don't, that's okay. Uh, I knew how I felt, which was similar to what Nick was saying. Uh, no, not really. Okay. Good. Well, uh, something to think about. Sixty years. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just uh, time passes rapidly. It certainly does, and. I always remember as a kid, they said 50 years from all the records will be released and everyone will know everything about it. And it'll be 
no one will ever know everything no, about it. No, this no. was this was really uh, uh, a day of uh, where America lost its innocence in so many ways. But we did fulfill President Kennedy's dream. By the way, that's a beautiful image of our Space View Park where right. Sandy yep. Storm did that awesome sculpture yeah, of him. And the sculpture of the moon and mm -hmm. the, the earth there was stylized after the logo Program there. Symbol, right. And we're very proud of that, just a few blocks away from it here yeah. in downtown Titusville. Well, let's talk about the fun trip back to the moon with these Navy buddies. Well, this is perhaps the most beautiful of the Apollo patches. It, it's always caught my imagination. Uh, you've got an all-Navy crew, so naturally you're going to have a clipper ship involved here going around the, uh, going around the moon. And the original crew, the originally the lunar module pilot for this uh, flight was going to be C.C. Williams, Clifton Williams, a Marine. Uh, unfortunately, C.C. was killed in a T-38 uh, crash uh, here in Florida. Hmm. And uh, at the time, Alan Bean was working in the Apollo Applications Program, trying to psych out all the pieces that would be necessary for the Skylab program. Now, originally, when Pete was talking with Deke Slayton, he wanted Al for the LEM pilot slot, and uh, Deke declined and put CC instead. And then after CC passed away, uh, uh, Pete went back to him and asked for Al Bean and got him. Now, if you go back for a minute to the mm -hmm. patch, let me point something out on this patch. You'll see the four stars, three above the clip clipper ship and one near the, uh, the tail of the trajectory. That fourth star is for CC, oh. and it was put there at the insistence of Alan Bean. Now, question: uh, A great man died in a in the taxis, the T thirty eight. Was that a a, a bird situation? That uh, bird that, strike. I think the bird strike was, was uh, Ted Freeman. I okay. Think Ted Freeman hit a snow goose. Okay. And right. I, uh, uh, I, I I can't recall the circumstances between uh, 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 about uh, CC's action, but okay. I think the bird strike was uh, Ted Freeman. There's a, yep, a few that uh, could have easily been uh, in the Moonwalkers' mm -hmm. vocabulary there. Uh, yeah, be beautiful clipper ship, American flag, yeah. the moon location there where they were going to land. And, of course, the, the blue and gold navy colors. Absolutely. And just a stunning, stunning patch. And when you see it in uh, actuality, you see the, the cloth patch itself, it's very shiny, very sparkly, not uh, untowardly so. Yeah, but it just has a it has a it has some glitz think, in the it uh, has some presence uh, all of its own. Uh, the Roman numerals carried over from mm -hmm. Gemini to mm -hmm. Apollo. Yeah, uh, you've got your Gemini Seven t -sh uh, shirt on today mm -hmm. with the Roman numerals there, and it'll be interesting to see on the patch for Artemis Two if we go back to Roman numerals. Which, if anybody's listening, I hope we I do. I hope we do yeah. too. I like the Roman numerals yep. there. And here they are, the three guys. Uh, I mean, you can just see the friendship in their eyes, uh, the uh, the fun-loving nature, the good humor. Uh, Pete, as I say, having been the uh, chosen in the second group of astronauts, he had applied for the Mercury Seven, but due to his uh, attitudes during the medical testing, uh, <laughs> really? well, he was he was very impatient with all these medical tests that were being thrown at them. And also with a psychological test. And there's a famous story that the psychologist for the Rorschach test handed Pete a blank piece of paper and said, what do you see? And Pete took it and he looked at it for a while and said, but you've handed it to me upside down. And the psychiatrist took it and turned it upside down. <laughs> and it's, it was Pete was just doing that to all the doctors and all the psychologists. Uh, there was a, 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 a great uh, confrontation between him and General Schwichtenberg at Loveless Clinic. Uh, and it had to do with the fact that these guys were having to give themselves enemas quite often. And Pete apparently came into the general's office with one of these bags and slammed it down on the table and said, General, you're looking at a man who's given himself his last enema. Either things shape up around here or I ship up, ship out. And the bag is sitting on the desk gurgling back and forth. And eventually it was written down on his chart, not suitable for long duration space flight. <laughs> but um, I can't recall who it was. Uh, one of the Navy guys in the seven had contacted Pete and said, reapply for the next group. And this time the uh, medical examinations were not as dire as they had been for the original seven. So Pete stuck it out and he was selected in the second uh, group. 
And then after he flew Gemini 5 with Gordon Cooper, he was originally going to quit after one flight and go back to the Navy. But one day he told Dick Gordon, he says, you know, Dick, he says, you can't quit after one flight. And Dick said, how come? He says, because I'll think it scared you so bad that you ran away. So he said, you got to do at least two flights. And of course, Pete ended up doing four. Great, great, uh, great stories there. Uh, between these three guys, just had to be constant one-liners. Well, there going was on, and they were bound bound by their experiences at Patuxent River Naval Air Station, the Naval Flight Test Center, Pax River. Pete was an instructor, and I believe he instructed both Dick and uh, Al Bean. Uh, he he flew with Dick, of course, on Gemini Twelve, and I think he saw Al Bean as a real comer. And when the opportunity came to uh, give Dick his uh, feedback on the crew for Apollo 12, he, as I say, he originally wanted Al Bean, eventually got him. And uh, the three of them, they are just the penultimate crew as far as uh, fellowship, good humor, and camaraderie are concerned. There's just not another crew like no, them. No, no, not, not at all. Not to say other crews weren't bonded. Right. You know, they're in different ways different there. Ways, yeah. uh, my researcher, Marty Winkle, looked up C.C. Williams there. Uh, the cause of his uh, uh, fatal T-38 crash was mechanical failure, yeah. caused flight controls to stop responding, and his ejection seat failure. Mm -hmm. Sounds like some electrical... Com com that, that's sad down there. Thank you, Marty. Uh, and anyone that has any questions today, pop them here to the one and only Mr. Nick Thomas here. Um, wanted to mention that we lost Pete way too early at age 69 in 1999 in a mm -hmm. motorcycle mishap. It was a harmless little off-the-road skid off into a, a bank in California and well, ruptured was, his spleen or something, I think. There was one engineer who knew Pete during the Apollo program, and when he was, he was asked about Pete's untimely death, the guy just summed it up perfectly. He said, you had to know that Pete would have a Harley. <laughs> okay. And that was just his nature. And uh, as many of you know, uh, at Johnson Space Center, every time an astronaut passes, they plant a tree in his memory. And Pete Conrad's tree is festooned with colored Christmas lights. Because Pete's motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful. Oh, really? Oh, I'd love to be out there. Those yeah. of you in the Houston area, send us a picture of that. Uh, both Dick and uh, Al lived to be uh, in their 80s, yep. I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Al Bean become a famous uh, painter of, of, famous of, artist, of yeah. his experiences there. Something he actually wanted to do before he became yeah, an astronaut. Yeah, absolutely. In there. And like we, like uh, Nick was going to talk more about the Nick just enjoyed life to its fullest. Yeah, there, yeah, right? very <laughs> much so, very much. And I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. When Pete and Dick were getting ready for the Gemini Twelve mission, uh, Pete's wife Jane uh, uh, said of Dick Gordon, "said he has animal magnetism." <laughs> Yes, and after right. that, Pete Conrad would continually call Dick the animal. The animal. Hey, animal, what do you think of this? And yeah. he just, Dick would just grit his teeth and just deal with it. But, oh, my uh, gosh. Yes, again, yeah. you know, you got friends like that, and only friends like that are going to give you the, the needle that That's way. right. Yeah. That's right. Just Isn't it fun, folks, reliving these wonderful people yeah. uh, that aren't around anymore? But that's what we love doing at the American Space Museum. Nick, you do. Uh, in your profession is is keep the lives of these people alive. Yeah. These are the true pioneers mm -hmm. of exploring to an alien world. Yeah. Well, I, I threw this in just if you're curious what their signatures look like. Yeah. Uh, I always think that's kind of cool on there. This is the postal cover. November 14th was the day of the launch, 1969. They landed four days later uh, mm -hmm. or on the 19th, five days later, I guess. So, yes. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, the stories abound of the Corvettes uh, that were leased to the astronauts from Dick Rathman's uh, Chevrolet dealership uh, down south. And uh, the Apollo 12 crew lived up to that uh, uh, particular image and then some with their blue and gold paint schemes on their Corvettes. Uh, their flight titles uh, festooned on their doors just like on a fighter jet, oh, wow. uh, CDR, PLT, and LMP. And of course, there are stories about the guys being on the Cape with the these Corvettes and shooting over the bridge and close one after the other with all four wheels off the ground as they shot over the bridge. It's the uh, what we now call the Roy Bridges Bridge. The Roy Bridges that, Bridge, that, okay. That spans Cape Canaveral, <laughs> Space Force Station, and uh, KSA. 
Uh, so these these guys were definitely living the life and living at large. Um, you just don't see astronauts. Uh, the last time I can remember seeing a, a group of astronauts coming to the terminal countdown demonstration test, I think it was J.O. Creighton's crew, and they were all driving nondescript rental car convertibles. You know, it's like, you know, no Corvettes, not anymore. But for a while, that was that was the way of the world. You leased, you leased a Corvette from Rathman for a dollar a year. And then, uh, of course, after that, I'm sure Rathman sold it with the, well, you know, Pete Conrad drove this Corvette. That go. sort of thing. So, Famous was, Indy 500 winner, Jim Rathman. And, what, and it was, what, a, what a smart thing he did. And a wonderful image. Well, he had been, when he was uh, offered a dealership, Chevrolet dealership, he was said, well, you can either go to Miami or you can go to Cocoa Beach. And Jim Rathman knew what was coming with Project Mercury, and he knew pilots needed cars like cars needed pilots. So he said, I'll take Cocoa Beach. Thank you very much. And then that's when he started. And Dick Rathman, by this whole campaign, literally put the Corvette on the map and basically made it America's sports car. There's your 1969 yeah. Corvette. What kind mm -hmm. of engine was in that? Do you remember? 350, I think, something like that. Uh, well, they had big block. They had their own mechanics, probably. Well, uh, well to too, it. and they 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 had them uh, cranked up. They take them back to the gym, and they were constantly getting their gear ratio changed and things like that. Anything to 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 hop it up. There was a famous story of Alan Shepard and Gordon Cooper who were racing their Corvettes. And Cooper kept beating Shepard. Shepard would take his car back to Rathman and say, you know, fix this thing up. I'm losing these races. You know, juice this thing up and see if we can get going here. And every time he took it back and he'd race Cooper, he'd lose by a larger and larger margin. And then finally, Cooper confessed to him that he was in on it with Dick, with Jim Rathman. And he would have his gear ratio uh, adjusted downward so his car wouldn't react as quickly as it should. So that was, <laughs> oh, that was a gotcha from Gordo oh, to God, Al. That is a gotcha. I don't, I don't know that Al went to his grave ever forgiving Gordo for that. Let's get these guys training for the moonwalk here. Mm -hmm. We got Nick Thomas talking about the Apollo 12 mission uh, in 1969. Uh, the, do the math right. That's 54 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second moon landing, a uh, very precise, uh, uh, after the Apollo 11 just made it and grabbed some rocks and got out of there. Mm -hmm. This was a different uh, mission. Yeah, now one of the things we talk about here, uh, the idea of doubling down on Kennedy's commitment, that was more or less a political and a public relations uh, thing. But for the engineers at NASA, the primary goal for Apollo 12 was to execute execute a pinpoint landing because they were never really certain exactly where Apollo 11 had landed. You know, they had that, I think, five foot per second delta V that caused them to land long and so forth. And they never really got it down directly on map where exactly they landed in the Sea of Tranquility. So the NASA people said, you know, if we're going to mount these missions for these scientists to pick these particular rocks from these particular areas, we've got to be able to prove that we can execute a pinpoint landing. So the, end, the the scientists and the geologists wanted to go straight to the rock collecting, but the NASA people said, no, we're going to convince ourselves that we can execute this before we start going on with your, your landing. So um, one of the places they found was Oceanus Procellarum, the Sea of Storms. And the great thing about that was in one of the craters, we had the surveyor spacecraft that had landed two years earlier. So there's your pinpoint right there. There's your target. So they started working around the idea of, landing close to the surveyor crater. And if they could do that, they knew they could execute accuracy in every, mm -hmm. all the next landings and be able to land where these geologists wanted uh, us to land and to uh, pick up the samples that they needed. Well, and of course, we, we know that worked out fine. We'll yeah. say some pictures of that here, but let's get to the training and what was a very tricky launch. Now this picture here, uh, this training picture was taken over at our flight crew training building here at Kennedy Space Center. And if you could see farther into the background, you would see a viewing gallery and the buses would pull up to this building. And if the crew was in training, the visitors would get off the bus, walk up the stairs on the outside and walk in and be able to look down and watch the crews doing this uh, training. Wow. This brings to the fore the story of Pete Conrad and his rather volcanic vocabulary 
Uh, he spoke like a sailor, really like a sailor, and he would just let the expletives fly when the when the mood hit him. And Alan Bean told him one day, he said, you know, Pete, you, you got to be careful. You know, if you're on the moon and you cut loose with some of this language, we're going to get in trouble. And Pete told me, he said, Al, my boy, he said, you don't understand. He said, professionals like me, we know how to turn it on and turn it off. <laughs> it's amateurs like you who get tripped up and end up spitting something <laughs> out over a microphone. So <laughs> that's and he did keep it pretty clean on the moon. Yeah, there well, were, yeah. Uh, uh, a bunch of whoopies and by golly goshes and stuff like that. Yeah, There's a the, classic image. Here are the guys in the LEM simulator. Um, I don't know if this is at KSC or at JSC, but you can see the closeness of those uh, quarters inside of uh, Marty's spacecraft. Yeah, familiar and territory to our co-producer Marty here behind the stream labs. Just over their heads, you see banded by a yellow handhold, the Apollo optical telescope. And then on the, uh, just by Pete's hand there, that's on the armrest, is the rotational hand controller. To the other side of that flight station is the translational hand controller. And by that way, you could uh, assume command of the uh, spacecraft in any manner of degrees. Now, the ideal uh, the ideal uh, 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 configuration coming in for the landing was to allow the computer to do roll, yaw, and pitch, and you as a commander would handle the throttle. You'd bump the throttle up or bump the throttle down, and that was done with translational hand controller, and one of the guys told me that if you bumped it one click down, you'd take it down 10%. If you bumped it up one click, you'd take the engine up 10%. So this was the blending of the uh, human and the spacecraft. Uh, but as we know, on a number of occasions, including Apollo 12, uh, the commander would have to take control both of the translational and the rotational, as Neil did, going over that football field-sized crater. And Pete ended up doing on uh, uh, Apollo 12. But uh, a very complex machine, uh, to look at it today, uh, people of today's generation would think of it as being rather archaic. but you got to remember at the time, this was the height of our technology. And this vehicle was doing things that had never been done before in the uh, in the realm of flight. And uh, it was just a remarkable spacecraft. Uh, some of the uh, bulkhead walls in that vehicle were probably about as thin as a dime. Uh, one Apollo commander told me that when he got on board the LEM up on orbit and looked down at the forward hatch and saw that it was bowed out slightly due to the air pressure, it's like, okay, we are flying in a fractal <laughs> spacecraft. But uh, I learned many, many wonderful secrets of the uh, of the lunar module when I was privileged to meet the Grumman guys with Marty and his and his team. And uh, you just can't overstate the importance of what those men and women were responsible for getting that vehicle flying, doing the checkouts, doing the preparation, and it was it was just the whole. 400,000 Apollo people across the country that were making this possible, and they were such an integral part of it. Absolutely. Spacecraft. Pride in their craft. Yeah, and, yeah and, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, not uh, uh, they got the job. They did what it took to get the job done, mm -hmm. is what I'm yeah. trying to say. And that same philosophy came through with the, not only the Apollo program, but the shuttle program, and will come through. Uh, in the uh, Artemis program because this is an inherent mindset of anyone who works with the program in any particular uh, uh, function of the program. Mm -hmm. It's that sense of excellence. It's that sense of getting the job done and getting it done right. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, here's a special uh, picture there. There we are on board. The... The, we're on board the Retriever here. This was a ship that would take the crew out to the Gulf to practice uh, uh, getting out of the command module on the open sea. And you can see Pete with his favorite cap on, <laughs> and the guys are being briefed on what I expect would be tomorrow's operation of suiting up, getting inside the spacecraft, and going through a full recovery exercise out in the Gulf of Mexico. Then we get back to the Space Center there, this uh, beautiful yeah. picture. I'll tell you, the that's... Full frame of that, it really looks awesome. It, it is so hard to reflect on this picture without becoming very, very philosophical. This this photograph represents so many things from the national will, the national consensus, to the pride in workmanship and the professionalism of, uh, as I say, the men and women who worked on all aspects of this vehicle. 
a four million pound machine, 92% of that four million pounds was fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most powerful rocket in the world at that time, uh, 7.5 million pounds of thrust and uh, just a remarkable, remarkable spacecraft and something that even the Artemis II will have a hard time living up to, I think, uh, because we were dealing with, in this with so many of the new unknowns, uh, particularly the Pogo effect and things like that. And this vehicle actually found a lot of the answers that, are, that will make the Artemis, uh, the uh, SLS rocket possible, which has made it possible. Well, uh, it was like 11 for 11 or whatever, never, never failed. Uh, and a tremendous vehicle and, uh, you know, all, all rocket sense have, have uh, looked up to this yeah, one, this literally. Is, yeah. So, ah. breakfast time <laughs> before the launch. Yeah, and what, launch what in the world's going on there? Now, in the background with Pete is the crew mascot. And this was Pete's idea. And the mascot's name is Irving Pinkle. Irving Finkel? Pinkel, P I N K E L. Okay. Irving. I cannot recall the genesis of that name. It may have been a pad worker. I really don't know. He's, he's dressed out as a pad worker. Yeah. <laughs> but that was Pete's idea and just typical of the mindset that these guys had. <laughs> it really you looks know, like a good ape, a real ape. <laughs> yeah, it is. It fools a lot of people to <laughs> how the monkey get there, you know, and yeah. who dressed him up. But uh, yeah, it's uh, again indicative of the. Uh, the uh, sense of uh, camaraderie and the sense of humor of this crew. You got Dick Gordon checking out the box mm -hmm. scores or football scores mm -hmm. in November, probably. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's, of course, Al Bean in the foreground yeah. there. Uh, so uh, going out to the launch pad. Now, already at this time, it's raining. It's drizzling out there. It's kind of a steady drizzle. And uh, the weather is, at the very least, uh, you could call it marginal. But here are the guys coming out of the ONC building, as we've seen so many times before for Apollo crews, as we've seen so many times for the shuttle, and as we've now seen for the uh, Artemis, uh, the Artemis II crew who came out and did a suit up and uh, 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 pad exercise, did the same walk, same way that the astronauts have for uh, decades now. So this is the crew getting into the transfer van. I think that's Dick waving mm -hmm. and Al being there uh, behind him. November 14th, mm. 1969. You get a good profile of uh, Pete there. Mm -hmm. He kind of yeah. had a big nose, well, to he say was, the least. Well, <laughs> don't forget the bubble shape of that helmet kind of affected your oh, features. Yeah. Yeah, and right. I remember when John Young flew with Mike Collins, Mike Collins said that that, that convex or concave, I can't remember which it is, that view uh, gave uh, John Young kind of a longer nose and gave him a kind of a foxish appearance which mike said he liked <laughs> so yeah that's a little bit of the distortion due to that uh that well, it was raining moment. though really yeah really yeah coming day. down there you can see there it's it's raining and uh coming out of the crew van and going over to the elevator to uh go up to uh the uh, spacecraft level out of pad 39a yellow galoshes on their feet there yeah the galoshes to keep the dirt away and when you got up into the white room uh, the the uh, white room floor was mounted with what we call a tacky mat, very sticky yeah. material. So then you could take the booties off, and then any dirt that was on your actual spacecraft boots would be uh, uh, grabbed by that sticky uh, tacky mat in the white room. Well, I got to be thinking about the the moisture it got on their spacesuits during this. Uh, well, there was uh, kinda, the, of course it's going to be used in vacuum of space. The so. the thing uh -huh. about the moisture out there was when the uh, water got up under the uh, boost protective cover on the command module, uh, it left streaks on the windows, and the change in pressure uh, caused these streaks to basically embed themselves in these windows, and I, I should have uh, included some of the window views because it really did spoil the uh Right. Oh, it did. Out okay. The, the CM windows. Yeah. Yeah. They they look like uh, your yeah, typical you inside annoying. a drippy mm -hmm. window yeah, in a house. Except something. they didn't continue to run down. They just stayed there. All right. Well, here's the launch, and lo and behold, there's a. Uh... See. Ah, very good. Thank you. That uh, 35 mils, and the lem skin was about 0. 0.012 mils of aluminum. A dime is 53. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, excuse me. Okay, yeah. As thin as can boy, be. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, that's uh, 
And that's your life on the line in a spacecraft that can't come back home. So here we are in the uh, a VIP viewing stands. We see President Nixon, who was the first American president to uh, attend a live, a, a manned uh, uh, launch. Uh, to the right, we can see his wife, Pat, partially obscured by that umbrella handle. To her right is uh, Tom Paine, who is at this time is now the uh, NASA administrator. Below him, with his head turned away from us, I think that's Jim Webb. And then to Jim's left, that will be Tricia Nixon. So the president is here to see this launch, and you can see the umbrellas are out. There has been a lot of conjecture over the years, which I cannot personally speak to, but a lot of conjecture that there was a little extra pressure on the launch team to get this thing off the ground because the president was in attendance. Vice President Agnew was in the firing room, and as vice president, he was chief of the uh, uh, National Space Council. So there's always been uh, the thought in some quarters that mm. the presence of these two men led to some more pressure than was necessary to get off the ground that day. I honestly can't speak to it because I haven't spoken to anyone who give me any more um, uh, intelligence on that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a nine in the morning launch, I believe, yeah. something like that. Here's the yeah, white the, room. The loading up inside the vehicle. Uh, uh, this will be Pete Conrad and to his right, Alan Bean. And the way you can tell lunar module uh, crew, commander and pilot, you see that gray material on the back. That was to avoid any uh, uh, erosion of their suits by the portable life support systems when they were on the moon. So that was like a big patch of um, gray uh, 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 duct tape, if yeah, you will. Just, uh, it had that same, that same so kind of reinforcement yeah. so it wouldn't erode the uh, the pressure vessel itself. But here they are getting inside in the vehicle. I see Pete still got his booties on. The tech might be getting ready to remove them. But of course, this is always a highlight of the mission uh, for the crew, uh, for the uh, launch crew in the white room, and for the public watching, uh, watching mm -hmm. on television. And you can see that scene in the Cosmosphere in Kansas, mm -hmm. where I've been, yeah. that beautiful space museum, yeah. actually has a recreation of that yeah. in there. So you can get uh, very cramped and very uh, <coughs> focused, everybody there. Again, <coughs> another view coming out of the Vehicle Assembly Building. And I just included this picture because it's a damn pretty. I love that one, too. I, so I, I used that one in our Apollo 12 the other day. It's an unusual view. Uh, it's just, God, it's just so massive mm -hmm. and beautiful at the same time going out there. <clears throat> and launch. Here we are taking off pad 39A and remembering uh, when I was 12 miles away, shortly after the vehicle uh, cleared the tower, she went straight into the clouds. Now, right. the lightning strikes that occurred occurred at 32 seconds and 56 seconds into the launch. Now, the air, being as stormy as it was, this air was packed very tightly with electrons. And basically what happened was the Saturn V generated its own lightning. It was like going through those densely packed electrons was like, it was like a child shuffling his feet on a carpet and touching something and zapping it. So they generated this charge that went through the rocket, down the exhaust plume, and then grounded out on the launch pad there. Now, the first strike took out all the fuel cells, took out all three fuel cells. And uh, uh, the second strike, as I recall, was the one that knocked out the, uh, uh, the ADI, the uh, attitude directional indicator, the eight ball on the control panel. But along the way of all this, not only were the fuel cells taken offline, the command module batteries kicked in appropriately, but they didn't have the charge to carry all the electricity that was needed for this phase of the flight. Then you had all the caution and warning lights being triggered. Uh, these command module uh, batteries were exclusively reserved for reentry and landing. So if we got out of this thing, the first thing we're gonna have to do is recharge those batteries. So all these things start to cascade. And if you go to YouTube, you can find the, uh, uh, the launch, and you can hear the uh, air to ground, you can hear the flight director's loop, and you can also hear the onboard um, uh, comm, the ICOM, the intercom. So you get the, uh, for instance, when the call came up from uh, John Aaron to flight to uh, Jerry Carr, SCE to auxiliary, Pete repeated it and said, what the hell is that? 
but luckily Al Bean knew where that was. Here we have a, a close-up of the caution warning panel. Yeah, he said, what think, the hell's that God famous and, and legend there? This, this panel was lit up like a Christmas tree, and like, um, oh, Leo Krupp from uh, North American, he was he was watching this launch with Walt Cronkite and Wally Schirra, and I'll never forget, because I had it on tape, where Leo said it was probably like using a, a, a test circuit to light up the whole panel, which effectively is, is what it did. So when you had all those lights come on and Pete is reading them down to the ground, uh, this is basically the this is basically Pete singing the pilot's death song, which is to call out all the readings, all the lights, so after they're killed, the guys on the ground can reconstruct the accident and make it safer for the next That's, crew. He, he clicked he, into he, that. He mode. just rolled right into it, test pilot mode, right uh -huh. away. You know, I got to get all this stuff down to the ground before we before we either blow up or crash. Now, a six million pound rocket mm -hmm. is shaking them like crazy inside there. But the great and... the great thing about this whole accident was, even though the uh, command module guidance had gone off the uh, off the wire. The guidance unit, the instrumentation unit for the S-4B was still working and kept that vehicle on trajectory the whole time this bloody business was going on inside the command module. So when you listen to the onboard uh, ICOM, uh, the guys are definitely purpose-driven, but they're not panicky. Uh, in some cases, they're kind of laughing about it. But uh, again, it was the tremendous professionalism of these three test pilots along with the professionalism of the people in mission control that got us through this 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 terrible spike and later on I, in one in one phase uh the ground called them to uh was it realign the platform uh yeah or I, it was either realign the platform or bring the fuel cells back online but pete jumped in and said wait for staging because Pete knew that we could get those systems back online, but then drop off the first stage and find ourselves back in a similar, if not a worse situation. Mm -hmm. So Pete very wisely said, wait till staging. We had staging, and then we had the time to bring these systems back online properly. And I think the last thing the, that the crew did was to uh, uh, realign the platform. They did that in Earth orbit, but Dick Gordon said that right ball was just drifting around just tumbling around of course it didn't reflect what's happening in the spacecraft because it was disconnected but they got the fuel cells and buses back on the line and were able to execute a proper spacecraft checkout in earth orbit the one thing no one knew uh, may have been affected were the pyros to fire the mortars to deploy the parachutes and we had there was no way of checking those so basically the although never expressed the thought was, well, if we bring them back home and the shoots don't work, they're going to be just as dead than they would be if they went to the moon and came back. So let's go to the moon. And that was that was the right way to go. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, uh, Pete having his hand on the escape tower switch? Well, the abort handle was in the command module. It was your left-hand translational controller. And if you, you crank that, handle about 45 degrees to the left that would fire off the uh um launch escape tower which would pull the command module away but to the best of my knowledge i think pete said that he never had his hand on that abort uh, yeah, i never heard of anyone talking yeah. about abort and yeah. that as crazy as it was yeah. but yeah. Uh, but uh, so well you they... know that's what they say the difference between a pilot and a test pilot yeah a pilot says i got 10 seconds before i crash the test pilot says i got 10 seconds i bet i could save this thing <laughs> and that was go. very much on exactly on display that day. <clears throat> well, they're on the moon. We'll see the pinpoint yeah. landing here in a minute. Yeah, this is Al Bean coming down the ladder of that beautiful uh, lunar module. If you look to the left, just by the American flag, you see that what looks like a lump of tin foil. That's actually the Mesa, the modulized equipment storage area, which contains the camera, which photographed the astronauts as they came down the the ladder uh, to the lunar surface. The Mesa also carried a number of their tools and other equipment. Uh, the scientific stuff was carried in one of the app quads in the uh, ALSEP package, the Apollo Lunar Science Experiments package. So right. this, this vehicle being as, they got every ounce of weight worth from this vehicle. I mean, it was just so well designed, 
so well engineered and of course so well executed when the time came thrilling moment for al bean there to mm -hmm. finally make the great moment for him yeah. al bean by the way uh was a friend of our artist friend chris cowley oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. out there and uh there's there's a situation love this picture beautiful picture and there's your base there's your lunar module there on the horizon and that might look like a relatively short distance but when you think about the possibility of having a, a plus failure or some other failure in the suit i'm sure that would feel like a long long away away in the distance it landed in what was called pete's parking lot yeah that's what they called it and it was again only 600 feet away from the surveyor crater and when pete was coming in for landing there is the the famous audio when they p64 and push over and you get your first view out the window and pete begins to exclaim right down the middle of the road and pete talking about it years later said that when they pitched over the lpd the lunar the landing point designator in his window the crosshairs were centered right on the surveyor crater and pete said when i saw that i realized this country could do anything that's amazing yeah. that, that uh and they could uh it's uh but Nick, uh, I understand this wasn't the most accurate moon landing. The most accurate is Apollo 14. Apollo 14 Al has Shepherd. a record, Alan Shepard. And God, you knew if Al Shepard was going to be involved in the competition. That he yeah, was going to right. Come out He's a I Navy mean, guy, too, of course. There's just absolutely no dispute about that. But uh, The Al Admiral made the, outdid the, the captain. Yeah, the and, he, and Al overcame a lot of problems with that spacecraft in order to make that. They uh, did. Yes, landing, yeah, so. we'll have you back to talk about that. But, but. that doesn't throw any she any shadow on Pete. That's Heck for sure. No. Here we uh, are on the if surveyor. They, if they want him to land in that crater, he probably <laughs> would have done it. Here we are, six hundred feet away from the surveyor crater, and uh, this would be, I guess, this would be Al. We didn't have the red stripe. Iconic that had time image of uh, to the differentiate for sure. But there is a surveyor that had landed two years ahead of Apollo twelve, and uh, uh, of course the object was to gather pieces off of the surveyor and bring them back to see how well they survived in the uh, lunar environment for uh, two years. And doing my research earlier today, uh, they said that when they got to surveyor, it was quite pristine, very clean, because when they flew over the crater, their exhaust blew all the dust off of the surveyor and basically cleaned it up, which yeah. is kind of cool. The uh, scoop uh, that you see to the right yep. of uh, is in the... Uh... Cosmosphere mm -hmm. in Kansas. The yep. <coughs> the camera is in the Smithsonian, yep. and I've seen that with my mm -hmm. own eyes. Uh, so, uh, and that solar panels on the top up there. That was a very important landing to prove yep. that we could uh, the tensile strength of the surface is what they were testing right. Now. Make sure that we weren't going to sink yeah. up to our kneecaps. Oh glory! Now here we are raising the flag on Apollo twelve. Now as you see here, the flag is not properly erected because the retaining pin at the corner failed it was either missing or it was broken so that flag the idea was you swung that arm up and that pin would lock and uh -huh. you'd have the typical old glory picture that you saw for apollo 11 others instead what you had here was the only american flag on the moon that uh, drooped looking much like a flag behind the president's desk i suppose but the flag is a flag is a flag and I don't care what it looks like as so long as it's there. That's right. Yeah. And they're still there. Incredibly, yeah. we know by lunar orbiters and so forth, it's yep. still there. Got a lot of good people watching us today, uh, Nick Thomas, and we always enjoy you being on once a month here. Uh, the guys uh, had a little fun on the moon. They they, they had fun <laughs> finding some uh, unhidden uh, hills and valleys, I understand. Now, there, this Nick. was, God bless them, this was the work of the backup crew. And I, did, I talked about this at length with... Uh, Al Warden. Oh, did you? Largely involved in making this Imagine happen. Imagine that. <laughs> if you listen to the comm on Apollo 12, you'll hear Pete Conrad giggling his head off. And what had happened was this. Al Bean turned the, the page of his cup checklist. This is the first time they use cup checklist, by the way. Okay. And he turned the page, and there the on one side of the page are the instructions, and on the other side of the page are a picture of a Playboy uh, playmate in, you know, very, very uh, 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 lovely surroundings, shall we say, and little cues uh, behind them. Some of them have said, look for the protuberances. Yeah. Have seen you seen any, any interesting, any interesting <laughs> hills or valleys? 
And as Al told the story, he saw these first, and he went over to Pete, who was still over at the surveyor, and they go through this thing, and that's when you hear Pete giggling his head off because they're looking. And of course, they didn't mention what they were looking at, but Pete just got such a big kick out. They both did, and at one point, <laughs> you'll hear Pete say, "Boy, that thing sure deployed, didn't it?" And you can bet he wouldn't talk about the surveyor. Let's <laughs> see. Well, and we're... there's an interesting side story to this. Oh, okay. These two ladies who are in these pictures, they actually showed up at the post-flight uh, press conference for Apollo 12. And their plan was to raise their hands and say, well, how did it feel to go to the moon with us? <laughs> and they were going to, you know, kind of boost their own careers in doing that. Luckily, somebody somewhere along the line recognized them. I I think they got into the room and NASA security invited them to step outside, which was a way to avoid that problem, uh -huh. which they did. But it would have been interesting to have these girls get up and say their piece in that post-flight press con. Now, for the girls, we got to be fair, Judy Resnick took Tom Selleck up to space <laughs> with her on a shuttle. Now, right. The other thing that came out of that, that post-flight press conference was Al Bean was up there on the uh, 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 dais, and he made eye contact with this pretty little reporter in the front row. And there's a little eye contact, and I think a wink was thrown across the way. And after the press conference, when everyone was kind of milling around and chatting, Al saw this girl coming toward him, and before she could get to him, he held up his hand and said, Sorry, honey, just testing. <laughs> That's I'll tell you, that's something else there. Well, we are enjoying this conversation with Nick Thomas, his stories about the Apollo 12 crew. Uh, we gotta got to get them home here. There they are. There uh, they are on the water now. You can see they're all shaking hands. Great moment. They Mission, don't have Mission, the full Mission. body suit that Eleven had Thank on now. Thank God. Uh, now, Mike Collins told some terrible horror stories about, about those biological isolation suits. Imagine yourself in a completely sealed rubber suit with only a tiny visor to look out of what's uh, going to happen to that visor yeah he's going to fog up it's going to fog up and mike said he could barely see his hand in front of his face and was scared to death that coming out of the helicopter going to the trailer that he was going to trip and fall which luckily he didn't so by this time everyone kind of gotten a hold of themselves and uh, they went to using these respirators uh much more sane much easier to use and in fact, Apollo 14 would be the last crew to go through this post-flight nonsense. And after that, uh, the crews just disembarked uh, onto the uh, carrier deck as, as they used to during Gemini. And this picture, I think, sums up the crew in one single picture. Best friends, they're going to have fun doing whatever uh, they have to do. Uh, they're going to do the job to the best of their ability, but they're not going to pass up the opportunity to have a good time. And uh, as I say, as the young people would say, three besties hanging out on a good day at Patrick Air Force Base, having flown in from uh, Johnson Space Center and getting ready to go to the moon. Pete did have that hat in a lot of pictures. Yeah. He kind yeah. of was attached that was to his, what it said it, on it's it. It's like a... Uh, like a uh, a fisherman's hat. Okay. Uh, I didn't have any words written on it, but he eventually pinned a uh, button of the Apollo 12 patch up on the, the front of it. Interesting yeah. there. So, uh, God love them. They're buried with inside of each other yep. at the Arlington Cemetery yeah. at the family's request. Uh, uh, and uh, just, uh, we appreciate you sharing a little bit of their lives. And I would, with us, Nick. I would recommend anyone out there to go to YouTube. There's a wonderful video on YouTube about the Apollo 12 reunion, the guys getting together years later, just before Pete was killed, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. And they just trade the whole story. They relive the flight amongst themselves. Uh, there's no narrator. There's nobody a asking questions. It's just the three of them recounting, just like mm -hmm. three sailors swapping sea stories. Uh, so I'd recommend that folks look at that and also the, uh, uh, the other Apollo 12 videos online, which recreate the mission and go into a lot of the background and show some beautiful images. Great. No definitive books. Uh, neither astronaut wrote a, a an astronaut book. Of course, Al Bean's got several books of his wonderful art in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
I mean, Pete and, and Dick Gordon, there'd just be a lot of expletive deletes. Well, and, well look with them. <laughs> Pete, Pete was too busy and Dick was too lazy. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Well, we enjoyed uh, this with you, Nick. Uh, Neil 1030's been watching. Marina R is watching. She is in the Ukraine, one of our weekly watchers here. Uh, wanted to say that we honor Pete at Space View Park as we do the other three astronauts. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Pull out their, oh, sorry there, Marty didn't pull their pictures out there, but our Space View Park has Pete's relief out there as they mm -hmm. harvested the handprints uh, after he passed away. And you see space workers' names there mm -hmm. yeah. that uh, we honor. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I would love for, I work for Newsweek there on Madison Avenue. I'd love for them to call me up one day and say, give us a hundred bucks and we'll put your name on the side of the building. Because <laughs> that's what, this is about our yeah. space workers. Yeah. Uh, people like me were a dime a dozen working at Newsweek. The astronauts, the space workers are truly the astronauts treasures. will tell you that the space workers were the real heroes of this program. And we love we love uh, honoring them all the time. Uh, as we're talking, Cliff Watson's watching in Pomona, okay. Australia, enjoying springtime there. Robert Laws in Dundee, Scotland. Cynthia Rossi, you know Cynthia, she's enjoying today's show. Good. Uh, Bill Whiting is back up in Michigan of our astronaut club out there. Mm -hmm. He's our, our unofficial chairman of the astronaut club, isn't he, Marty? Oh, Bill Whiting. Uh, Tom Celentano is up in Connecticut. Doug Forrest is in Los Angeles. Dave Stangy, Yes, sir. The Blue beat the Buckeyes. Uh, so yes. That team up north uh, clobbered us again three years in a row. So I'm, I'm going for Michigan for the national championship fair, Dave. And he was at the stadium, and I'll share that picture tomorrow when we talk about Steve J and how he wants to help stay curious in the American Space Museum uh, financially in our, our fundraising drive. And Gary Gerald is our Vidalia onion farmer and peanut farmer up there in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Gary, hope you had a nice Thanksgiving with you and your wife, Donnie. Yeah, I want to say uh, hello to some of my friends. Of course, my wife, Laura, uh, Mary Beth, and Josh Hunter, who are out there. Uh, terrible Terry Wilcutt. There you go. Always good to work with Terry. Uh, darling Valerie Egan. Uh, Wendy Lawrence. And, of course, from the uh, uh, Space Geeks, Tammy and Bill. Well, thank you all. De definitely. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for wanting to do this. Uh, well, one final comment. Um, what happened on this uh, mission and this awesome photo that, that I don't see enough of this mission Uh uh, is to the right is the camera mm. and the camera got exposed accidentally to the sun yeah. and it wiped out the video and we never saw anything like we did on Apollo 11. It would have been spectacular to watch yeah. them walk down to Surveyor. Uh, then we never so from July 1969 to Apollo 14 in February of 1971, we saw no live images of humans walking on the moon. Do you think that affected the public apathy? That... Uh, I'll say that it affected the interest of the networks. Uh, as far as the public is concerned, it led to a lot of disappointment. Uh, not necessarily apathy, but a great deal of disappointment. I don't know, I don't know what the uh, Trendex numbers were for the Apollo 14 EVAs, but uh, the 14 uh, crew used the same color camera technology that we would have seen on Apollo 12. And although it was color, it was still not really, really sharp. You didn't start getting the really sharp images until Apollo 15. Yeah, 15. And 15, amazing. you could you could cut some of those the, some of those images with a. They were just so sharp and so clear. Um, I have a uh, an ongoing debate with with Fred Gregory about uh, uh, public interest, and Fred is afraid that since the Artemis flights for now. Are being scheduled out as only one launch per year that that might not be able to build a lot of public interest and then i would counterpoint and i would say that well you know apollo launched several times a year and they still launched lost interest so maybe with the very slow flight rate of artemis that might actually build suspense anticipation whatever you want to call it but it's hard to say it is just so hard to judge the uh the American public as far as their interests and their uh, uh, focus on things like this. Uh, we don't have the circumstances that we had in the 1960s. We don't have a Cold War. We don't have the goal of a martyred president. We don't have a timeline. 
you know, uh, President Kennedy said by the end of this decade, for the end of this decade, we don't have that kind of uh, pressure on the program now. And whether that's good or bad, that's what is so. But um, I think the Artemis program is going to build its own momentum. Uh, how far and how wide that momentum will travel, only time will tell. Uh, I do know that the, the people who are engaged uh, with a program to the degree that you and I and Marty and Bill and Tammy and all the rest of us are, I know we'll be watching. Um, it's my hope that the young people out there will have the same sense of excitement that I had in 1968 when on TV they announced that the crew had been given a go for translunar insertion, and I understood what that meant. And I walked into the kitchen where my mother was preparing dinner, and I said, we're going to the moon. And I think that one memory of, of many of them that just really stands out in my mind when it suddenly hit me, the enormity of what we're going to be doing. And I hope that moment awaits another young person in the near future when we go back to the moon. Well, great words there from Nick Thomas. I agree with you there. It's, it's so... Uh, uh, the, the climate of what's going on in the world and so forth is so fickle with, with what Americans uh, uh, embrace at the time. A lot, of thing, a lot of bad things going on right now, as there were back in 68 and 69. But the country powered its way through it and uh, was able to achieve this incredible goal that has not been matched. And in my mind, will never be matched again. Well, looking up. I think it helps everybody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, look at the numbers that are being broken attendance-wise where you work at the K Visitor Center Complex. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and what always impresses me, Nick, is I hear three or four foreign languages all the time well, going on. Easily. People all over the world yeah. love 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 uh, space and what we're doing in space and, and the space leaders. And there, in, in some ways, I would like to transfer that excitement of the internationals to our somewhat jaded uh, young people of today because right. the the people from around the world who have seen this uh, throughout their lives are very impressed by it and they're very uh, they're very involved with it um, whereas some of our own young people are just sort of like oh been there done that and I remember talking to Al, Al Ward about this and about the perception of young people of you know been there done that and I told Al I said you know if you ever had a kid say that to you the way I'd answer them would be, no, no, I've been there and done that. You haven't. There you go. You know, there so you the go. challenge is now on your shoulders. Well, we hope everybody's enjoyed this wonderful program with Nick Thomas. There's so much information. We get sidetracked with a lot of great space history stories that we are reliving here through these great workers at the Space Center and, and uh, space workers themselves. So, Nick, thanks again. Can't wait to have you back again. Uh, once a month, you enjoy doing this, and we're going to have you back as long as you want to. So. Thank you. Uh, Marty, great job on the Streamlabs there. Let me show our little meme here, I like calling them. I'm hooked on that word, not that one. We'll go forward again to remind you all that you can watch Nick's program anytime on YouTube. Mikey Haddad's going to be here Wednesday talking about STS-51A. And Chris Stott mm -hmm. is going to be here Friday on a recorded program. Chris is CEO of Lone Star that wants to put your data on the moon, your baby pictures, your financial records, whatever, uh, in case that big uh, solar flare wipes out humanity's uh, memory bank somewhere. It has happened in the past and will no doubt happen in the future. Chris Stott, married to astronaut Nicole Stott. And uh, a great guy. You're going to enjoy that recorded program with Chris on Friday. So once again, thank you, everybody, for taking your time to enjoy Space History with Nick Thomas. I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.